This podcast is brought to you by Prolongevity, the award-winning eight-week program that can transform the lives of people with prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, and many other lifestyle-related illnesses. Founded by Graham Phillips, the pharmacist who gave up drugs. Hello, and welcome again to the Prolongevity podcast. And I'm delighted to have as my guest today, uh, the wonderful Sam Apple, journalist and the author of this astonishing book, uh, uh, titled Ravenous, Otto Warburg, The Nazis and the Search for the Cancer Diet Connection, um, which um, I spent the last few weeks uh, reading, and it really is a fabulous tale. It's such a good tale, I think, that if it was fiction, you wouldn't believe it, because there's so many different threads running through the story. And um, I think as a, as a good a place to start as any is uh, the inside of the front cover, which reads as follows. The Nobel laureate, Otto Warburg, a cousin of the famous uh, finance Warburgs, was widely regarded in in his day as one of the most important biochemists of the 20th century. A man whose research was integral to humanity's understanding of cancer. He was also among the most despised figures in Nazi Germany. As a Jewish homosexual living openly with his male partner, Warburg represented all that the Third Reich abhorred. Yet Hitler and his top advisers dreaded cancer and protected Warburg in the hope that he could cure it. Now, while the vast majority of Jewish scientists fled Germany in the terrible years leading up to World War II, Warburg remained in in Berlin. As the Nazis goose-stepped across the continent, systematically rounding up and murdering millions of Jews, including the majority of my, I'm Jewish, including the majority of my ancestors, Warburg awoke each morning in an elegant, antiques-filled home and rode horses with his partner, Jacob Heiss, before delving into his research at the Kaiser Wilhelm Society. Now, we're going to do things slightly differently from how we normally do in the Prolongevity podcast, which is, having read Sam's book... I have to say that the quality of the writing is superb and exquisite. And I don't think most podcasts have done your text justice, Sam. So what I've asked you to do is read a few passages through the book as we as we sort of traverse the narrative of the story, uh, which, Sam, you've kindly agreed to do. Um, just one final quote, because I've been reading Jason Fung's latest book on, on cancer, And it says, this is what Jason has written. Sam Apple is a spellbinding storyteller and explainer of science. Ravenous will change the way you think about cancer and how to prevent it. Thought provoking and captivating. I highly recommend it. Well, needless to say, I I don't differ in any in any respect to to what Jason had to say. Say. So I thought, Sam, perhaps we'd start off. Um, if you'd be happy to read the first few pages of the intro to the book, which kind of sets the scene, and not only sets the scene, but it gives the uh, and gives context, but it also is a beautiful exploration of your writing style. Uh, okay, I'd be happy to, and uh, thank you for the very nice introduction. Um, on January 16, 1934, a Nazi customs official arrived at the door of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Cell Physiology with a stack of papers. A recently issued Nazi decree required scientific institutes to obtain a special license for the purchase of ethanol. The Institute for Cell Physiology had sent in its application six days earlier, but had failed to return all of the necessary documents. Noticeably missing was a declaration of Aryan descent from its director, Otto Warburg. The Nazi official had brought along a blank form so that this oversight could be corrected. Like most of the other scientific institutes of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society, the Institute for Cell Physiology was located in Dahlem, a quiet neighborhood of elegant villas in the southwest corner of Berlin. Though connected to the city by train, Dahlem, sometimes called the Oxford of Germany, was a small world unto itself, home to a significant portion of the greatest scientists alive. In the years before the Nazis came to power, it would have been hard to walk from one end of Dahlem to the other without bumping into a Nobel laureate. Otto Warburg himself had won the Nobel Prize only three years earlier. He was considered by many to be the greatest biochemist of his generation. 
Standing on the doorstep of Warburg's Institute, the Nazi customs official, Mr. Tesh, was likely wearing the uniform of his office with a green swastika adorned sash visible on the sleeve of his long wool coat. As Tesh would have known, it was no accident that the Declaration of Aryan Descent was missing from Warburg's application for an ethanol license. Warburg may have been the most famous Jewish name in all of Germany, though best known as the family behind the legendary Hamburg-based M.M. Warburg and Company Bank, the Warburg influence extended beyond finance. Members of the family were leading scholars, artists, and philanthropists, a veritable German-Jewish aristocracy in a country that, long before Hitler, had severely restricted the place of Jews in public life. Otto Warburg's mother was not Jewish, but it only took one Jewish grandparent to make him a non-Aryan, according to the Nazi regulations of 1933. Warburg had two Jewish grandparents, and his famous Warburg cousins in finance were frequent targets of Nazi propaganda, the very symbols of Jewish capitalist greed. Given that Warburg also lived with the male servant rumored to be his homosexual partner, he had as much reason to fear the Nazis as almost anyone in Germany. The door to the Institute was opened by an employee, probably one of Warburg's research assistants, who told the Nazi official that Warburg was unavailable. Tesh left the blank Aryan descent forms with the employee, making clear that he needed it returned within 48 hours. Three days later, still awaiting the filled out form, Tesh called the Institute. A secretary answered and passed the handset to Warburg. I served in the military and was an officer. Warburg blared into the phone. It is out of the question that I will sign this form. Though Tesh already knew that Otto Warburg was not of Aryan descent, there was something else about Warburg that he likely did not know when he placed that call. Whether Warburg was the greatest biochemist of the era was debatable, but he was almost certainly the most self-important biochemist who ever lived. As a colleague put it, measuring arrogance on a scale from 1 to 10, Warburg rated 20. Warburg was so enamored with himself that he once refused even to be photographed with a group of scientists he deemed beneath him, and a number of the scientists in the group were Nobel Prize winners. For someone entirely convinced of his own greatness, the idea of Nazi lowlights telling him what chemicals he could and could not order was almost unthinkable. As Warburg once put it to his sister, Ich war vor Hitler da, I was here before Hitler. Still fuming days after the phone call, Warburg ordered his secretary to call the customs office that had sent Tesh to his institute. Professor Warburg does not wish to see the customs official who delivered the forms again, the secretary announced, and if necessary, would have him removed from the building. The Nazi official on the other end of the line was stunned, but Warburg's secretary wasn't finished, asked to explain why Warburg was behaving so rudely to a government official. The secretary responded that Tesh arrived at the Institute unshaven and had spread unpleasant odors around him. The odors, he clarified, had presumably originated from an unclean body. The Institute for Cell Physiology, the secretary explained, had to ensure a meticulous level of cleanliness. To the hygiene-obsessed Nazis, few insults could have been more offensive. While the archival documents suggest the secretary was a she, it was likely Warburg's male partner, Jakob Heiss, who told off the customs officials. Heiss, who would later become the administrator of this institute, was rarely far from Warburg's side, and he was in the habit of shouting people down on his behalf. A glassblower who worked at the institute after the Second World War remembered Heiss screaming at unwanted visitors in exactly the manner of the secretary on the phone with the Nazis. Warburg's message did not get through to the customs office. Tesh reappeared at his institute that same day demanding the completed Aryan descent form. An employee led him to a laboratory with an open door. Standing before the entrance to the room, the Nazi official came face to face with several researchers, including Warburg. Warburg was a handsome and compact man. He kept his hair short, neatly parted to one side, and swept back over an always cleanly shaven face. On the day that Tesh returned to the Institute, Warburg may have been wearing a white lab coat over one of the cardigans or tailored English sports coats he favored. Few things annoyed Warburg more than the interruptions of his work. To avoid unwanted visitors, he installed a brass plaque by the door of the Institute, indicating that visiting hours began at 6.30 p.m. In photos, Warburg's heavily lidded blue eyes have a dreamy quality, leaving the impression of a man lost in deep thought. But if Tesh directed his gaze to Warburg at this moment, he almost certainly would have been met with eyes that could fill with spark shooting rage, as one biochemist recalled. Tesh had never met Warburg and did not recognize him as he stood before the laboratory door. As Warburg approached, Tesh raised his right arm to the ceiling and stiffened it at 45 degrees in a rigid Nazi salute. 
Warburg was expected to salute back. Instead, he walked past Tesh and into the hallway without speaking. Tesh was flabbergasted. It was an outrageous disregard of a civil servant who is a representative of the National Socialist State, he wrote in a report on the incident. With Warburg now standing beside him in the hallway, Tesh demanded his name. According to Tesh's testimony, Warburg turned halfway around, announced who he was, and pointed down the hall. There is the door, Warburg said. Leave the building. Warburg would have to repeat the demand several more times before Tesh finally departed. Warburg immediately filed a formal customs office stating that the Institute no longer had possession of the form Tesh wanted and that it no longer needed any ethanol. For all his bravado, Warburg was likely nervous. After sending off his complaint, a secretary, presumably Heiss, called the customs office and asked what would happen if Warburg were never to provide evidence of his Aryan descent. The matter, the secretary was told, would be addressed to the Kaiser Wilhelm Society, the parent organization of Warburg's Institute. At this point, according to the report of the customs office, Warburg's secretary announced in a tone of derision that Warburg's institute was privately funded and did not need to follow the instructions from the Kaiser Wilhelm Society. The Nazi customs official had heard enough. The office sent a report to the incidents to Max Planck, president of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society and the effective head of German science. In it, Tesh said that Warburg had grossly insulted him and demonstrated a disregard of the German salute that was, in his opinion, characteristic of Professor Warburg's attitude toward the current state. Unless Warburg apologized, the report stated, further steps could be taken against him. Planck recognized the seriousness of the threat. On February 13, 1934, he sent Warburg a telegram. Honored Professor, the president asked you to appear for a consultation on Friday the 16th of this month, 12 o'clock at noon, here at the palace, Heil Hitler. While there is no record of what was said at the meeting, Planck let the customs office know that he had spoken to Warburg about his behavior and that further requests for ethanol would come from the administration of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society rather than directly from Warburg's institute. Warburg, having seemingly avoided even the slightest consequence for his actions, might have left the matter there. Instead, five days later, he sent a note to Planck stating that the new Nazi restrictions made for impossible working conditions. Something needed to be done, and Warburg had a suggestion. He wanted Planck to contact the Reich Ministry of Finance with instructions on how to adjust the existing racial decrees. Warburg even offered specific language for the revised legislation so that it would be clear to all that non-Aryan Institute directors were to be treated like Aryan directors. In 1934, at a moment when Hitler had already begun sending Germans to concentration camps, Otto Warburg, a gay man of Jewish descent, wanted Nazi laws rewritten according to his personal needs. And in many ways that... I mean, that could come from a Tarantino movie. Uh, quite extraordinary. And in many ways, it kind of sums up the whole of the book. So, Sam, um, you're known more to the American audience, less, I think, to the UK audience. So just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Uh, sure. Um, I did not start out as a science journalist. I studied creative nonfiction and uh, early in my career was writing sort of long form travel pieces and just sort of, you know, general interest journalism. Uh, and it was really uh, while working uh, on my second book uh, called American Parent, uh, I became really interested in, in the science behind parenting techniques. It was really personal in a lot of ways. I was trying to understand how to be a better parent and to understand if there was really any meaningful science behind all the advice I was getting as a new parent. I, Jen, I, I concluded that there was not really any science. <laughs> Make it up as you go along like the rest of us. Yeah, but uh, I guess, you know, partially seeing how flimsy the science w was behind parenting in many respects, you know, made me a little bit more skeptical. And, you know, I was always to some extent interested in nu nutrition. And then I ended up reading more about that. And, you know, I read uh, a famous article by Gary Taubes that uh, appeared in New York Times magazine about, um, you know, diet and fat and carbohydrates and so i became interested in those topics and then um you know i started to write more about science and then really you know became especially interested in cancer just because i was, really because i was so surprised that uh cancer was linked to obesity and diabetes and metabolic syndrome i had always in my mind you know put it in a completely separate realm and it was just really shocked to, to see how closely related cancer is to these metabolic conditions 
Absolutely. And how you understood it is how most, sadly, still most health professionals are, are educated. So the book took five years. Why was that? Um, well, a, a lot of reasons. I mean, one, it's a big, complicated story. Uh, two, is it uh, required you know, a lot of knowledge of biochemistry, which I didn't really have uh, at the beginning, which, you know, was a challenge. I had to do a lot of reading and learning. Uh, much of the source material was in German, which, you know, didn't make things easy. Uh, sometimes, you know, 19th century German. <laughs> and, um, you know, putting... In addition to all that, I think that, um, you know, when you're creating a narrative, it really takes a few years to, to take all this information and to, to see how it all fits together. So I feel like my brain needed time to kind of synthesize it. Yeah, I mean, having read it, the extraordinary depth lengths that you went to, not just to describe Warburg and his life, but to describe the little asides that are there all over the place. I mean... I think it's an astonishing work. It, you know, that's it, it's hard to do it justice, and that's one of the reasons I wanted people to hear hear your voice and hear you um, read a bit from it. So, tell us a bit more about the environment in war, which Warburg grew up. His father was a famous, uh, influential Jewish pharmacist, and he was surrounded by an astonishing entourage of of, of the names of science in history. Yeah, his father was a physicist. And, um, you know, it was very rare at the time for a, a Jewish physicist to sort of reach the heights of German science, but he was a professor at the University of Berlin. And, um, you know, he really raised Warburg in a, in a house where, you know, the biggest names in science, including Max Planck and Einstein and Emil Fischer were, were coming in and out of the house. Emil Warburg, um, you know, played music, chamber music together with Einstein and, and others. And, and so Warburg, you know, these are his role models and the people he, he knows, he just assumes really that he's going to grow up to be a great scientist. Uh, really, the only question for, for Warburg was, you know, what field he would make his great discovery in. And in the end, he actually made great discoveries in a number of different fields. Uh, I decided to focus about cancer, but there are other books written about Warburg's photosynthesis research and his research on respiration. So, you know, extraordinarily brilliant and, and arrogant person. And, you know, the arrogance was comical at times, but I do think that, you know, it explains part of, you know, his greatness as a scientist, uh, you know, was really rooted in his boldness. You know, whenever he faced an experimental question that he couldn't answer, he just assumed that he was going to figure it out and would build new tools to solve it. It's really quite remarkable. And you describe him in the book as a consummate narcissist. Which he clearly is. Um, I don't know whether he had any ever, ever had any formal diagnosis, but given your previous book on parenting, have you got a sense of what he was he was suffering from and whether it was the environment he grew up that, that made him that way? Yeah, I mean, my, I mean, certainly some form of narcissistic personality disorder. You know, I don't have any expertise in that area, but. Uh, I believe it's largely innate. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that uh, you can really give somebody that condition by the way they're raised. I'm sure he was raised in a home where he was told he was great and that didn't, uh, you know, that didn't necessarily help things. But, um, you know, it, it, I, I think it's pretty clear that it was just his innate personality. And, and again, it's led to his greatness in many ways, but also to his downfall, you know, his, his arrogance really, and then his last decades really alienated many people who may have been allies and, and ultimately, you know, set back his, his cause to the extent that his cause was explaining the metabolic explanations of cancer. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. So Warburg and the Warburg family and the Jews in Germany at that time very much saw themselves as good Germans. Yeah. And you mentioned that when Germany went to war, I'm talking about World War I now, Warburg signed up yeah, um, out of a what we would now view as a misplaced loyalty to the German, to the motherland, I guess. Um, and you tell a, fa a fascinating story as how his father had tried to rescue him from the front line and Einstein intervened. You could just say a little bit more about that because it is an extraordinary story. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to, to go back to what you first said, I, I was really amazed by the extent to which Jews signed up to fight 
for Germany, um, you know, in the, in the end, 2% of all German Jews die fighting for Germany in World War I. And uh, one detail that, that stunned me is, you know, some Jews who had already uh, emigrated to uh, Palestine, to pre-state Israel, actually came back uh, to fight for Germany. Uh, they were deeply loyal Germans and, uh, you know, saw World War I as an opportunity to assimilate further, to prove their worth to Germans. So it wasn't surprising that, that Warburg uh, signed up. And Warburg also signed up for the most aristocratic unit that they had, these uh, lungs, you know, they rode on horses. So he actually really quite liked the military. Uh, and, you know, he, he wanted to stay up until the end, even, you know, in 1918, by the end, it was clear that things were going disastrously for Germany. and. Uh, Warburg's parents were desperate for him to come home. You know, it seemed pointless. Millions of you know, Germans were dying uh, throughout the war. And um, Warburg was staying. And finally, uh, Warburg's parents reached out to Einstein. And they said, you know, write him a letter, try to convince him to come home. They intuited uh, that Einstein might be one of the few people he listened to. And, you know, Einstein writes this letter, which seems, you know, perfectly written for Warburg. He t- talks about how great you are and how German science needs you. I mean, he understood Warburg's vanity and that would be the way to convince him. So he writes a letter and sure enough, Warburg comes home. Uh, it was shortly before the end of the war, but it's entirely possible that Einstein's letter saved his life. So uh, that's just kind of what you do, isn't it? When you've got a bit of a problem, you write to Einstein, he li- writes a letter on your behalf and it just kind of explains the milieu in which Warburg grew up. Yeah. Um, yeah which I think is hard to convey in, in any other way. Um, Warburg didn't stop. Sorry, carry on. I said Einstein loved Emil Warburg. I think that's why he did it. You know, mm-hmm. Emil Warburg had actually done experiments which proved some of Einstein's theories. And, um, he, you know, he, I think Emil Warburg was one of his favorite scientists. So I think that's what really explained it. So, but Warburg um, didn't start his career as a cancer researcher. So perhaps you say something about his early research and then what led him on to become a cancer researcher? Uh, Sure. Uh, I mean, I think from a a very young age, cancer was in the back of his mind. But, um, you know, initially, he was really very influenced by Einstein and his father in the world of of physics. And, um, you know, he moved beyond that in terms of going into biology and biochemistry. But it, it was always through the framework of physics, always through the interest in energy and how the principles that his father and Einstein studied, um, you know, could be explained, could help explain biological phenomena. You know, photosynthesis was actually the perfect field for him in that way, and that it combined these two interests. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned before, that Warburg wanted to make a great discovery and, um, you know, to be the next Pasteur, you know, the next great scientist who saved humanity, particularly influenced by Robert Koch, the the German um, bacteriologist who had, you know, saved the world from infectious diseases, as, as the Germans would say. Yeah. So yeah, really, I, I think he was just thinking about what what would be the great discovery that would make me, you know, the modern savior. And I think that's why he turned to cancer. Uh, so some of his earliest exper- experiments don't look like cancer research. He's actually studying uh, sea urchin eggs, which is, you know, common. Uh, model organism for animal sea urchins. And he's studying how the sea urchin eggs grow, how much oxygen they need to grow. Uh, so it looks like sort of fundamental questions about science, and, and it was. But ultimately, in his mind, I think he's already at that point thinking, well, whatever explains how a sea urchin grows may also explain how a cancer cell grows. So the cancer influence was there. But in his early studies, it's really focused on, on respiration, how a cell uses oxygen and how much oxygen it needs to power its growth. Which is kind of threaded through everything else that he did, obviously. So what was the dynamic in Germany at that time around cancer? And how did it sort of play into the Nazi ideology and the ideology of Hitler in particular? Because that's something you go into in considerable detail. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing to note is that um, the Germans were extremely focused on cancer throughout uh, Warburg's early life. Uh, and, you know, as he was becoming an adult, cancer was becoming a bigger and bigger issue in German life. Um, 
you know, as I write about in Ravenous, it had been a relatively rare disease, you know, a century earlier, and then starts to creep up in, in the 19th century, become more common. And by the late 19th, early 20th century, it's actually becoming quite common and, and a panic, you know, in the first decades of the 20th century, a real panic is starting to emerge because the Germans are, are making so much progress against other diseases, really at the top of the scientific world in almost every field, uh, you know, you had to speak German even to be a scientist at the time because all the journals were in German, but they couldn't make any progress against cancer. And, um, you know, I think that Hitler also grew up in this environment and was a hypochondriac and, and was also interested in making great discoveries, as I talk about later, in, in his own twisted way. Uh, but, but Hitler actually had a more personal experience in terms of his mother had breast cancer. It was, you know, historians say his mother was the only person he was even capable of loving. Yeah. And it's a fascinating story. He's, his mother is treated by the family's doctor, who's Jewish, the Austrian Jewish doctor, Edward Block. And um, Hitler quite liked the doctor and was grateful for his services. And, uh, you know, Edward Block later wrote that he'd never seen a human being as depressed as Hitler was as he watched his mother die from breast cancer. So from that point on, Hitler is very focused, I would say even obsessed with cancer. And, you know, what one thing that, that I found interesting along the way is that um, both Hitler and Warburg grew up, they, they were born six years apart and during their childhood, the most famous German most celebrated German was Robert Koch, and they're both great narcissists, Hitler and Warburg. You know, Warburg, I never want to compare anybody to Hitler, let alone Warburg, but you know, just the great narcissist born at the same time. And they both end up growing up and believing that they're sort of the reincarnation of Robert Koch. Uh, you know, Warburg said it was, in a, in a sense, had a legitimate claim to it in terms of great cancer discovery, but Robert Hitler said, I, I too am Robert Koch. I've discovered the, the basilisk, uh, you know, the bacterial agent of social decomposition, which is the Jew. So yeah. it was really fascinating for me to, to see those things in parallel. Uh, absolutely. Um, so Warburg then ultimately went on to study medicine and ended up with his own institute at a remarkably young age. And I thought perhaps you'd elucidate a bit around that. Yeah. I mean, he, he did study medicine, but even while he was studying medicine, he was really focused on, on basic science. I don't know if yeah. there are many who got an MD doing actually less clinical work than Warburg, as far as I could tell. Yeah, sure. um, and um, so even while he's doing his medical degree, he's continuing to focus on, on questions of respiration, you know, what exactly takes place inside of a cell uh, that allows it to, to take oxygen and, and burn it burn our nutrients with oxygen you know at the time enzymes had been discovered but it wasn't even you know wasn't even entirely clear if enzymes were were involved and this is very early days. so Warburg becomes you know deeply interested in, in working on on the mechanics of, of enzymes respiration eventually when he wins the nobel prize in 1931 it's actually not for his cancer research but for figuring out you know what we now know is the last step of respiration uh the reaction between you know, oxygen and the electrons that are passed along the electron train and so on and so forth. But, um, uh, you know, he was always focused on, you know, basic fundamental scientific questions and was less interested in clinical questions. In that way, it was kind of surprising that he got into cancer research because, you know, cancer wasn't as clean cut as a lot of the, you know, the sort of physics based biological research he was interested in. And Threaded through also the rest of the story is his relationship with this guy, Jakob Heiss. Is it clear how they met and how their relationship began? Because Heiss seems to have supported him, you know, against all comers, against all odds, in all circumstances, almost blindly. Yeah. I mean, uh, it was, to me, I think, very clearly a, a loving homosexual relationship. I mean, they were not out in terms of saying we are gay but uh, i don't think anybody really was at that time and uh after warburg came back from the war uh just after world war one um apparently 
you know, he, somebody recommended that, that ice work for him as his, you know, something like a houseboy, a, a servant, I don't even know what you call it, but uh, I, I suspect that, um, it wasn't an accident that, you know, somebody sort of intuited that they were both gay and might be a good match. I, I don't know. There's, there's no way to know as far as I could tell, but, um, from a very early period, they became inseparable. And I think it's one of the most admirable things about Warburg is that, um, you know, he, he really didn't make any attempt to, to hide the relationship. In some cases, you know, wouldn't travel unless ice was also allowed to come along. Um, and, you know, they went to the opera together. They were, you know, took walks and horse rides around Dalham together constantly. They're really inseparable. And, um, you know, all this is in the context of the Nazi years where he's not only has this famous Jewish name, but also has, you know, an open gay relationship. You know, really nobody had more reason to be concerned uh, than Warburg once the Nazis came to power. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, so... It seems that Warburg's ultimate ongoing obsession through everything was how cells breathe, respiration. But he didn't have any of the modern equipment that we modern day scientists rely upon. Perhaps you could say a little bit about what very primitive equipment he did have and the extraordinary processes he had to follow in order to prove some science. I mean, I, I read the detail of it and I just thought, you have to all be kind of superhuman, really, to to, to imagine this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I wish I wish I'd re reread some of the book before. Yeah. Uh, 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 it's been a while since I, I myself have looked at some of these passages, but um, his sort of signature tool was the manometer, uh, which which he used throughout his life, and it's a really you know simple device, uh, sort of a, a U shaped device in which. Um, you can watch, you know, mercury levels rise and fall based on, you know, whether the cells in his vessel are uh, taking up oxygen or giving off carbon uh, dioxide. So um, it's amazing what, what a simple, you know, how much of his research was based on on such a simple tool. Um, and, you know, so when he made his, his initial discoveries, um, you know, with cancer, that that's really what he was doing was, was watching, you know, how much oxygen they took up. But, um, you know, the, the manometer that he needed to use didn't even exist when he started his research. He had to kind of redesign an older tool. And then he couldn't, you know, he had no way of getting the slices of the cancer uh, thin enough. You know, he had this tissue slice technique that he used, but he had to devise all these com complicated formulas, uh, you know, just to get a, a sample of the tissue that was the appropriate, you know, width. Um, so it's really remarkable. And then the, the enzyme work is really even more, you know, remarkable. They didn't have like machines, you know, and, and interestingly, as a side note, like a lot of the, you know, the, the sort of advanced techniques that they used today actually originate in some work that, that Warburg uh, did with, with radiation in terms of being able to detect, you know, changes in a reaction. But, but at the time, you know, uh, I think in the book, I use the analogy of it's like taking a, a smoothie with like a thousand different ingredients and then locating this microscopic enzyme within it. You know, so they had like, you know, 20 different techniques that they would do. You know, you filter it out and then you shake it and put it in the centrifuge and on and on and on. And, and even then, you're still not sure what you're left with. So the fact that he crystallized, you know, like half the enzymes of, of uh, fermentation using these techniques is extraordinary. You know, take other people years, and he would just knock out one after the other. It was really incredible, and, and a lot of that work went on during the Nazi period when he was, you know, not in a good situation. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, so I guess this is the right time, really, to talk about the Warburg effect. Um, what is it, and? In what way did Warburg convince himself that this was the root cause of, of all cancers, the sort of single root cause? Sure. So, um, you know, Warburg, you know, as we talked about, he survived the war in part thanks to Einstein. That's, you know, he comes back in 1918. And then uh, five years later, he, he returns to this question that he had begun his career with, um, you know, sea urchin eggs and, and how they fuel their growth. And his, his early research on sea urchin eggs convinced him that um, the key to the growth was that they would take up more oxygen. So when he sees 
especially to study how cancer cells fuel their growth, he assumes that uh, they also take up more oxygen, uh, which, you know, makes sense. But uh, what he found was, um, you know, they weren't doing that. And, and in fact, um, they were using, you know, mostly the same amount of oxygen as other cells, but instead they were fueling their growth by taking up a lot of glucose from the solution. And instead of burning it with oxygen, they were fermenting it. It's the same thing that, you know, that microorganisms do, the same process that gives us beer and bread and wine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Warburg's comment at the end of that first, you know, re- you know, remarkable paper was, you know, the, the, the key takeaway here is that uh, cancer cells seem to resemble yeast. Um, you know, they were behaving like microorganisms. And for Warburg, somebody who knew how cells generate energy better than anyone alive, it was such a fundamental shift. Uh, you know, in the book, I use the analogy of a, of a backup engine or a generator. Instead of using the engine, they were using a, a generator. And, and Warburg imagine anything more fundamental than shifting from one form of energy generation uh, or you know, energy extraction, if you will, uh, to another. So something that fundamental to him seemed to have to be at the root of the problem. You know, again, he, he thought like a physicist and uh, he thought this, this has to be the root of the whole story. Yeah. And became so fixated upon that as the single root cause that could no, could, simply couldn't affect, uh, accept any alternative hypotheses, which I think in some ways was his undoing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, particularly after the war, you know, his, his arrogance played a role and he, he started making more and more extreme statements. Um, you know, initially he, he had not found necessarily that, that cancer cells stopped using oxygen. What he had found and said is they continued to use some oxygen, but that they would take up all of this glucose and rev up this fermentation. But, you know, after the war, he becomes convinced uh, that this is the whole story and that there is no, there's very little use of oxygen and that cancer cells almost ex- exclusively ferment. And so then when other scientists came along in the 1950s using new, you know, radioactive uh, tracing, they could show that some, you know, some oxygen was still being used, you know, various cancer to cancer, but this was used to disprove Warburg. And rather than, you know, Warburg may have said, yeah, I, I never denied that. In fact, my first experiment showed that there was still being oxygen. Instead, he lashed out and started to, you know, mock everybody who disagreed with him. He appeared before a group of Nobel laureates and told them, you know, cancer cells exclusively ferment and everything else you've heard about cancer is garbage. And, you know, it was a shame as, you know, Warburg had a lot of enemies already and it it made it easier for them to dismiss them. Maybe they would have dismissed him either way, but it didn't help. He didn't help himself. So in the interwar years, Germany really dominated world science to the effect that essentially most scientific papers were were written in German, as, as you've alluded to yourself, you had to dig into that. Is it fair to say that most of that German science was led or, or substantially led by Jewish scientists? Um, you know, I, I don't know that, um, you know, the exact percentages, but um, uh, a very high percentage, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, many of them were were Jewish, but, you know, assimilated, they, um, you know, were like Warburg himself, you know, not, not very Jewish in, in, in the way you might assume, but came from Jewish families. You know, they were intent in, in many cases on assimilating in, into German life. And, you know, often, I mean, Warburg uh, eventually actually became a Protestant just so, you know, he could continue to rise the ranks of German science. So there's actually a lot of uh, conversions strictly because they were rejecting Judaism so much. It was just like something you had to do to be a part of German society. But, um, you know, the the extraordinary number of, you know, brilliant Jewish scientists in Germany at that time is it, it, really amazing when you go back and look. And, um, you know, all these people that... Uh, had had done so much for Germany. Suddenly in 1933, they were, you know, persona non grata chased out of the country and, and they were stunned. Uh, you know, they were in some cases war heroes and they were, you know, just essentially kicked out of the country. They couldn't believe it. And during those kind of interwar years, a lot of those German sign, Jewish scientists, the majority who were able to leave did so with one conspicuous exception, our hero or our anti-hero Otto Warburg. 
What's your take on why he remained? Yeah, well, I think that the passage that I read from captures that pretty well. You know, he just was so sure of himself and so arrogant. You know, he lived in this area called Dalam. They called him the Emperor of Dalam. And, you know, uh, as I read from him, you know, the thought that Nazi lowlights, you know, that's what, how he thought of them, were going to kick him out of his institute. It seemed unthinkable. He said, I was here before Hitler. And, um, you know, he was so sure of himself that, you know, when the brown shirts would come to his institute to harass him, he would chase him away, say, I'm going to burn down my institute if you bother me again. But one key thing to keep in mind is that um, in the early years, a lot of people thought the Nazis were going to be a short-lived phenomena. And uh, Warburg certainly thought that. And, um, you know, if he fully understood what was going to happen, I, I do think he would have left. But um, he, he, he went back and forth and, and he really struggle. One thing that really occurred to me is that in a way he knew himself very well. He knew that he would have been miserable anywhere else without his, you know, his institute and everybody doing exactly what he said. He said at one point, um, you know, for a normal scientist, you can find a new institute, but a king can't just find another kingdom. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's, um, but, you know, in the end, of course, you know, you know, by 1938, he saw that, but it was too late by then. Yeah. So uh, there's a kind of thread, another thread in your book, which um, so many fascinating threads about sort of Nazi belief in a pure Aryan race and the onslaught against the diseases of civilization. Um, something about purity of the countryside and some dietary aspects and this kind of infestation of, of the Jews. And I, despite my origins, I'd never completely understood that in the way that I do having read the book. Um, there's a passage uh, around page 138 that perhaps you'd read for us, which I think just encapsulates that. that. Sure. You know, by the way, I actually wanted to call this book a disease of civilization because it played off of all these different themes so well. But um, nobody would listen to me about that. The name you came up with was, was, was great, so I shouldn't worry on that score. <laughs> uh, do you, would you like me to read from the top of 138? Um, is it about halfway down? Let me just, I'll just offer in the page. Yeah, it's, it's from the top to the, um, basically that page, yeah, I think. It kind of encapsulates it. After that page captures it, so I'll yeah. read that that the Nazis were introducing legislation to distinguish half Jews from quarter Jews. At the same moment, they were introducing laws to keep the population safe from dangerous chemicals it was not a coincidence. For all its progressive innovations, the battle against cancer wasn't an aberration from the other tenets of Nazism. The entire Nazi project, Stanford historian Robert Proctor argues, can be thought of as, quote, an experiment of sorts, a vast hygienic experiment designed to bring us sorry, designed to bring about an exclusionist sanitary utopia, close quote. The Jews, though the most feared and hated, were only one of the many supposed pollutants the Nazis planned to eradicate. In Mein Kampf, it can be seen, can seem as though Hitler's unstable mind is incapable even of distinguishing Jews from bodily gross, as though the metaphor collapses under the weight of his rage. Was there any form of filth or profligacy, particularly in cultural life, without at least one Jew involved in it? Hitler wrote, if you cut even cautiously into such an abscess, you found, like a maggot in a rotting body, often dazzled by the sunlight, a kike. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, as we've mentioned, far from sort of cow towing to the Nazis, Warburg seems to have gone out of his way to wind them up. Um, and let's not forget that he was both Jewish and gay. And at yeah. various points, his very survival seems to have been in doubt. Uh, he reached a point where escaping was no longer an option. The Nazis were no longer concerned about their reputation. And there's an extraordinary few pages in the book where you describe what probably saved Hitler from the, from the gas chamber. Um, page 162, 163. Uh, I was saying Warburg from the gas chamber. <laughs> Sorry, what did I say? It hit there, but no, I'm uh, Warburg from the gas chamber. I do apologise. Uh, that's the gas. Yeah. All right. So, um, 
Yeah, can we from uh, starting on 162 with BRAC? Is that yeah. Right? yeah. Um, so maybe I should just give it as background. BRAC is, is one of the top Nazi officials uh, who is, is now called Warburg in for a meeting, which is seems like it's going to uh, determine his fate. Brack would have been wearing his black SS uniform that day, his senior rank reflected by the oak leaf patch on his collar. Warburg was joined by Ernst Telshow, the chairman of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society. Warburg, believing Telshow had played a role in his dismissal, refused to share a car with him. As Warburg sat in the very belly of the Nazi beast, Brack delivered the verdict. He did not grant Warburg a certificate of German blood. The application remained under review, but Warburg would be allowed to keep his institute on one condition. He would have to continue to work on cancer. I did this, Brack told Warburg, not for you, not even for Germany, but for the world. Warburg later said that Brack had probably saved his life that day. The Buhler and Brack did not have the power to make such a decision unilaterally. Himmler's appointment book shows that he met with Brack specifically to discuss Warburg that same day. And though Goering had boasted that he decided who was a Jew, the Nuremberg laws explicitly state that the privilege was, in fact, officially reserved for Hitler. Though he had credited Brack for saving him, Warburg never doubted that it was Hitler's fear of cancer that made it possible for him to survive. And there is reason to believe that Warburg was right. Hitler took the Aryanization process extremely seriously, busying himself with the minutia of applications for German blood certificates, even during the most critical moments of the war. Hitler was particularly concerned with the photographs and would reject anyone who appeared stereotypically Jewish. Given that Hitler is known to have reviewed applications for Mischlinge, that's uh, people who were oh, Jews. Hoping to be Aryanized in June 1941, and also that Warburg was a Nobel Prize winner working on a cancer cure. It is entirely possible that he intervened on Warburg's behalf prior to Warburg's meeting with Brack. Goering might well have reached out to Hitler directly. There are even grounds for speculation that Hitler, who was in the Chancellery on the day of Warburg's visit, was aware of Warburg's meeting with Brack. The highest ranking Nazis were, fo Nazis were focused even for a moment on Warburg on June 21st, 1941 is almost incomprehensible. That day was arguably the most critical moment of the entire Nazi project. Operation Barbarossa, the largest military operation in the history was scheduled to begin at dawn the next morning. The eastward push into the Soviet territory would be the fulfillment of Hitler's vision. In a single stroke, he would secure living space and grain fields for generations of Germans wipe out Jewish Bolshevism and demonstrate to the British that the German war machine was invincible. So that, I mean, that encapsulates it, doesn't it? That just at the absolutely fundamentally, probably most important decision-making point of the war, Warburg plays a role. You know, yeah. the they had yeah. even five minutes to, to consider it is, it yeah. is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was going to say, even Himmler had a meeting about Warburg on that day, and Hitler was talking about cancer research later that night. It's really incredible. Yeah. So um, it seems that we know that Hitler was a sociopath full of paranoia. He was also a drug addict and, by all accounts, a sugar addict. And you describe in the book beautifully how this cook would cook him all these cakes in the evening and by the next day they'd all be gone. Um but it seems that it was nevertheless, despite his obsessional hatred of Jews, was prepared to overlook someone's Jewish origins if he felt that they could injure, they could have advanced the German cause or indeed advanced the cause of the Fuhrer. And I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's actually um, a BBC programme titled Hitler's Jewish Doctor. So it, it is extremely ex fascinating. Anyway, World War II comes to the end, to an end. And I think the Russians were trying to recruit Warburg at that point, and he refused. And the Americans were also keen to recruit him. And he did, in the end, make his way to America, but it didn't go very well. Yeah, he, um, he did eventually, you know, I think the, the US uh, would have recruited him, but he was you know, sort of ranting and raving when they did their interview with him. 
And uh, I think they <laughs> decided to step back away, although there may still be more to that story. You know, there are some documents that are hard to get by, but um, it's clear that to some extent, both the Soviets and, and the Americans were recruiting him. Um, but he, he comes to the U.S. and um, he's invited by uh, Emerson, a, a scientist who's interested in his photosynthesis research. And, and it turns into a, a somewhat comical debacle. Uh, they get into a huge fight about photosynthesis. And, you know, in addition to all the cancer controversy, Warburg is maybe even angrier about photosynthesis. Uh, yeah. it's, this whole debate about, you know, how, how much really light energy is needed to to run photosynthesis. It seems like a small detail, but, but Warburg, you know, it was sort of outraged that anybody had challenged his, his findings. And in Warburg's mind, it was actually based on Einstein's research. He actually even went to Einstein one time and said, you know, are you sure that one quanta uh, of energy is all that's needed? And Warburg said, why? And Einstein said, well, that's a lot. <laughs> that was Einstein's answer to him. But um, so, you know, uh, eventually he goes back to Germany. But I, I think he, he would have stayed had things gone better in the U.S. But, uh, you know, he, he alienated a lot of people during his short visit and, um, you know, really drove Emerson, you know, this wonderfully kind scientist. I think he was literally driven crazy. He ended up just taking the bus round and round around the campus trying to clear his mind because Warburg was, was driving him so mad. So um, he came back to Germany and it was good timing because uh, the Americans gave him back his institute and, you know, he, the Germans were happy to have at least one person they could point to who had survived the war. Warburg was the only Jewish scientist of all the Kaiser Wilhelm societies to make it, you know, with his job intact throughout the entire war. So, as you said, he returned to Germany in nineteen, I think, in nineteen forty nine, and he resumed work at his institute. But you get the impression from the book, and tell me if I'm right, he never really regained his full command or the respect. Um, was that lack of resources? Was it his narcissistic personality, or was it due to so much suspicion about the fact he'd remained in Germany throughout? Uh, I think it was com I, I don't think it was lack of resources, but I, I think it was a combination of he was no longer the same scientist and a lot of suspicion about, you know, how is it that he survived? People thought he had collaborated. Um, so I think those those things combined. But, you know, the other aspect of it was, you know, changing winds in science that as, you know, more and more discoveries were made about DNA and the new molecular biology arose and people stopped taking, you know, the sort of biochemistry that Warburg focused on as, as fundamental to, to cancer and other conditions. Uh, you know, that was one of the great mistakes. So there are a lot of different things combined, but, um, you know, uh, I do think that, it, that if Warburg had only been a more sort of balanced personality, it would have made a difference. Do you think he delivered much of value after the Second World War or was he all pretty much done by then? Well, yeah, it's, it's a tough question. It's a good question. It's hard to answer. I don't think that his science ever reached the same level, but he, he did. But I think the most important thing that he did, you know, even though he made extreme statements and, and ultimately undermined his cause in some way, he was, you know, one of the very few people that, you know, he lived long enough. He died in 1970. He lived, lived long enough to see the onset of a molecular biology. And he was one of the very few people who was able to look at this and say that, you know, this is all great. And, you know, we should keep making discoveries, but we're missing something fundamental. And, you know, it can become almost a distraction to make new discoveries if you're failing to see uh, this fundamental thing. You know, of course, if he hadn't discovered it, I'm sure he would have cared about it less. But, you know, he he ha he still had clear eyes about what was fundamental to the carcinogenic process at an old age, and even though he was you know slipping in various ways, you know he saw things that other people didn't see. So I think he does deserve a lot of credit for that. Despite everything he'd been through and quite an extraordinary life, he actually lived to quite an old age. I think he lived to eighty-five. Uh, yeah, eighty-six. Eighty-six. Um, and he kept working in his institute right up to the end, as far as I 
as I can understand it. And there's a couple of passages from the end of the book, right at the end of the book, which sort of sums up his final days, which as a part of perhaps as a conclusion to our podcast, you'd kindly read for us. Uh, sure. How is that? Top three two seven, I think it was three two seven, three two eight. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just read uh, these last paragraphs of the book. Um, in November 1968, Otto Warburg climbed up the ladder in his library to retrieve a book from a high shelf. He had recently celebrated his 85th birthday, and he was in good spirits. In many respects, Warburg had written to a friend earlier that year. It was better to be old than young. The struggle for existence, the same Darwinian phrase he used to explain how competing cells turn cancerous, is over, and if one possesses luck and reason, one could still live for many years. Whatever regrets he had expressed to Beneslin about spending his life picking fights were now long forgotten. In a letter to Van Arden the previous year, Warburg encouraged his friend to continue his cancer studies in the face of criticism, just as he himself had. The more resistance I found, the more I attacked, and the better my weapons became. Warburg's one known ailment, heart palpitations, had first been diagnosed while he was a medical student. One of Warburg's professors, the famed Rudolf Krell, made the diagnosis himself and told Warburg to focus on lab work. No one has yet died from biochemistry, Krell pointed out. <laughs> the palpitations returned in the last months of 1956, and Warburg feared the problem might somehow be related to a blood clot. A doctor suggested cutting back on coffee, but assured Warburg that he had no reason to be concerned. At 85, Warburg might have lived a while longer, but on the third step of the ladder, his foot slipped. He fell backward, crashed into the floor of his library, where he lay with a fractured hip, helpless beneath Pasteur's cold gaze. Because the door to the library was closed, a sign that Warburg did not want to be bothered, no one immediately came to his rescue. The fall appeared to be a cinematic ending for Warburg, the Faustian hunger for knowledge and the preordained punishment encapsulated in a single act. In the film, the camera looking down on him from above would pull away slowly. Warburg, motionless on the floor of his Dalham Palace, would become smaller and smaller, a breathing speck, a single isolated cell. Warburg survived the fall, but was no longer the same. In the last week of July 1970, he felt a pain in his leg and was diagnosed with the blood clot he had long feared. Late in the evening of August 1st, the clot broke free and traveled up his body until it came to rest in a narrow passage between his heart and lungs. Although Warburg did not live to see the revival of his research, he never doubted that he would eventually be proved correct about cancer and everything else. Extraordinary. And I've had some wonderful scientists on my podcast, but none of them write as elegantly as you. So it really has been a, a joy. And I can absolutely see why you spent five years researching the book. Um, now, your book doesn't just tell a potted history of German science, the rise of the Nazis, then the life, of time of, life and times of Warburg. It also goes on to discuss in some de depth the root causes of cancer. And I very much hope at some point you'll return to our podcast and we can have a further discussion about all of that. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you. So I think for today, we'll, with our grateful thanks, we'll leave it there. Um, thank you so much, Sam, um, for giving us your time. And thank you so much for writing this extraordinary and fascinating book. I, I, it really is, you know, the best thing I've read in a very long time. And uh, I very much hope that we'll have you back on. Yeah, that's well, incredibly nice of you to say. And I'm, I'm grateful. You know, I love talking about the science, but I'm grateful for a chance to read and, and talk about the writing a little bit. So uh, thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed the podcast and want to find out more, join our Wellness and Pro Longevity Facebook group. Don't forget to subscribe and follow so you never miss an episode and maybe share to friends and family who might benefit. Finally, if you think you might need help with diabetes, heart disease or any of the other diseases we discuss, then book a free consultation with Graham. There's absolutely no charge for this and we would never put you under any pressure. What do you have to lose? Bye for now and see you for the next episode.